Welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast, hosted by Dave Jenkins. The Equipping You in Grace podcast is a podcast about helping Christians develop a biblical worldview in a conversational tone about issues inside and outside the church. Now, for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. Well, welcome back to the Equip You with Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And on today's episode, we're going to continue our series through contentment, talking today about contentment and the providence of God. Now, Blaise Pascal, the famous French philosopher and mathematician, noted that human beings are creatures of profound paradox. We're both capable of deep misery and tremendous grandeur, often at the same time. All we have to do is scan the headlines to see that this is the case. How often do celebrities who have done great good through philanthropy get caught up in scandals? You know, human grandeur is found in part of our ability to contemplate ourselves, to reflect our origins, to our destiny, our place in the universe. And yet, such contemplation has a negative side. And that is the potential to bring us pain. We may find ourselves miserable when we think of a life that is better than that which we enjoy now and even recognize that we're incapable of achieving it. Perhaps we think of a life free of illness and pain, and yet we know that physical agony and death are certain. Rich and poor alike know that a life of greater wealth is possible, but will grow frustrated when that wealth is unobtainable. Sick or healthy, poor or rich, successful or unsuccessful, we are all capable of growing vexed when a better life remains outside of our grasp. And yet, Scripture presents one remedy to this, and that is contentment. Biblical contentment is a spiritual virtue that we find modeled by the Apostle Paul. He states in Philippians 4.11, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. And so, no matter the state of his health, his wealth, or success, Paul found it possible to be content with his life. Now, in Paul's era, two prominent schools of Greek philosophy agreed that our goal should be to find contentment, but they had very different ways of getting there. The first of these is Stoicism. They believed that human beings had no real control over their external circumstances, which were subject to the whims of fate. The only place that they could have any control was in their personal attitudes. We cannot control that which happens to us, they said, but we can control how we feel about it. And so Stoics trained themselves to achieve an inner sense of peace that would leave them unbothered no matter what happened to them. The Epicureans were more proactive in their search for contentment, looking to find a proper balance between pleasure and pain. Their aim was to minimize pain to maximize pleasure, and yet even achieving a goal in this area can result in frustration. We might never obtain the aim for pleasure or having obtained it, we might realize that it does not bring what we thought it would. Paul was neither a Stoic or an Epicurean. Epicureanism leads to an ultimate pessimism. We can't get or maintain the pleasure we seek, so what's the point? The Apostles Paul's doctrine of resurrection and the renewal of creation does not allow for this kind of pessimism. Creation, according to Romans 8.18-25, through 25, says this, will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Paul also rejected the passive resignation of Stoicism, for he was no fatalist. Paul actively pressed towards his goals and called us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, believing that God works in and through us to bring about his purposes in Philippians 2.12. For the apostle, true contentment was not complacency, and it was not a condition on this side of glory that could admit no feelings of discontent and dissatisfaction. After all, Paul frequently expresses such feelings in his epistles as he considers the sins of the church and his own shortcomings. He did not rest on his laurels, but worked zealously to solve problems both personally and pastorally. Paul's contentment pertained to his personal circumstances and the state of his human condition. Now, whether he suffered lack or enjoyed material prosperity, he had learned to be content wherever God had placed him. No, this was something Paul learned. It was not a natural gifting, but something he had to be taught. And what was the secret of contentment that Paul learned? 
He learned in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So, in short, the apostle's contentment was grounded in his union with Christ and in his theology. He saw theology not as a theoretical or an abstract discipline, but rather as a key to understanding life itself. His contentment with his condition in life rested on his knowledge of the character of God and the actions of God revealed in the word. Paul was content because he knew his condition was ordained by his creator. And he understood that God brought both pleasure and pain into his life for a good purpose, according to Romans 8, 28. Paul knew that since the Lord wisely ordered his life, he could find strength in the Lord for any and all circumstances. You see, Paul understood that he was fulfilling the purpose of God, whether he was experiencing abundance or abasement. Submission to God's sovereign rule over his life was a key to his contentment. And as we continue to wrestle with the desires of the flesh, we can be tempted to believe God owes us a better condition than we presently enjoy. To believe such a thing is sin, and it leads to great misery, which is overcome only by trusting in the Lord's sustaining and providential grace. We find true contentment only as we receive and walk in the grace of God revealed in the word. You see, contentment is an inner position of the heart that rests in the providence of God. The opposite of a contented heart is a restless heart. A heart that is continually looking for more or different circumstances is discontent. 1 Peter 3 describes inner beauty as a gentle and quiet spirit. That's contentment. A gentle and quiet spirit is a heart attitude that has confidence in the goodness of God, in the wisdom of God, and in the control of God according to his sovereignty regardless of circumstances. Contentment is rooted in a humility that God knows all things and exercises his perfect will for his glory and the good of making his children more like a son. You see, God uses his power and his holiness to wisely bring about his purpose in everything. From the atoms to the birds to the hair to locations of people, God is providentially working out his plan. Hebrews 1, 3 states that God upholds the universe by the word of his power. Everything that God created is sustained by him through his active decision at each moment to hold each atom of every creature and thing in place. God could decide at any moment to remove the, the word of his power and the universe and everything in it would cease to be. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says that not a single sparrow falls out of the sky apart from the Father. God is intimately involved in each bird that he has created and sustains. Luke 12, 7 states that God knows and determines every hair that falls from your head. Think about all the billions of people that lose hairs all throughout the day around the world and the vast knowledge and the purposefulness needed to know and care about each hair. Acts 17 tells us that God determines the times and location of every person. There is no one you meet or run into each day that God is not providentially placed in your life. Ephesians 1.11 sums it up with the truth that God works all things according to the purpose of his will. This is the providence of God. So let me ask you a question. What do you find yourself discontent about? What is it that makes you grumble out loud or complain with your heart? See, we grumble and complain when we don't get what we want or when our circumstances don't fit our hope and our expectation. Maybe someone doesn't respond to us the way that we want them to. Maybe it rains when we'd rather have sun. Maybe traffic is bad or the driver in front of us is going 15 miles below the speed limit. Maybe our boss is grumpy or we can't seem to get caught up on our workload. Maybe a child is being defiant or a friend is ignoring your text. And yet from the smallest details of daily life to the gigantic events that happen once in a lifetime, the Lord is sovereignly working out his plan. Proverbs 16.30 talks about God, every decision being from the Lord. The context of Proverbs 16.33 is the casting of lots or the modern equivalent of rolling dice, gambling. Even the roll of dice in a kid's game is providentially planned by God. There is simply no such thing as luck or coincidence. God is always working out his perfect plan. Contentment rests on the truth of the providence of God. Contentment is learned when we submit to God's perfect will and trust that his wisdom, his goodness, his power are controlling every single aspect of the universe down to the minute details of our lives. 
Contentment is resting in God's plan for our lives, humbly admitting that our wisdom, our best laid plans, are nothing compared to the Almighty's wisdom and plans. Let me ask you some questions now. In what circumstances do you yourself need to submit to God's wisdom, his goodness, and his power in your life? What scriptures would help you remember that God is providentially working his plan in your life to make you more like Christ? You see, contentment is learned in difficult and easy circumstances. We must choose to renew our minds in the truth of God and pray that God would strengthen us by the power of his Holy Spirit to be content, commit to trust God, and to take him at his word. True contentment can never be known by those who don't know God. Unbelievers are doomed to live their lives with a sense of helplessness surrounded by anarchy, desires for true peace, safety, and lasting prosperity. They're unattainable, particularly for those who subscribe to atheistic and evolutionary belief systems. Those worldviews, they teach us that events are random, our origins are accidental, our lives are meaningless, and tragedy is inevitable. Those who close their eyes to the one true God remain blind to his divine plan and purposes. As John MacArthur argues, contentment can only be found through trust in the providence of God when he says this. Until we truly learn that God is sovereign, ordering everything for his own holy purposes and the ultimate good of those who love him, we cannot help but be discontent. That's because in taking on the responsibility of ordering our lives, we'll be frustrated in repeatedly discovering that we can't control everything. Everything already is under control, however, by someone far greater than you and I. You see, a synonym for God's providence is divine provision, but that's a label for a complex theological reality. Providence is how God orchestrates everything to accomplish his purpose. There are two ways that God can act in the world, by miracle or by providence. A miracle has no natural explanation. In the flow of normal life, God suddenly stems the tide and injects a miracle. Then he sets the flow back in motion, just like parting the Red Sea until his people would walk across it and closing it up again. Do you think it would be easier to say, hold it, I want to do this miracle and do it, or say, let's see, I've got 50 billion circumstances to orchestrate to accomplish this one thing. The latter is providence. Think, for example, of how God providentially ordered the lives of Joseph, Ruth, and Esther. Today, he does the same for us. The Apostle Paul learned the secret of contentment through understanding and embracing God's providence when he says this in Philippians 4, 11 through 12. I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret. Now, when Paul spoke about learning to be content regardless of what's going on in his life, he was informing the Philippians that he knew that God was providentially at work, regardless of whether they could send him financial support or if they could do it without for a time. The Philippian church had been a major supporter of Paul's missionary labor since his first visit to Philippi. About 10 years had passed since Paul was last in Philippi. Acts 16 relates what happened during his first visit. Paul and his traveling companions met a businesswoman, Lydia, and preached the gospel to her and her companions. Their conversion resulted in the formation of a church. Now, during the early days of that church, Paul cast out a spirit of divination from a slave. The girl's owner livid over the loss of the income that they had derived from her fortune-telling abilities had Paul flogged, thrown into prison, locked in stocks, and instead of complaining about the miserable situation in which he found himself, he praised God through thankful prayer and song far into the night. Now, the Lord responded in amazing ways. He shook the foundation of the prison so violently that all of its doors opened wide. Its chains fell off, prisoners' feet and wrists. That is an incredible experience, plus Paul's incredible response to the dismal circumstances. It led to the salvation of the jailer and the jailer entire household. And as the church at Philippi grew, it's apparent they helped fund Paul for further missionary outreach. But as Philippians 4.10 indicates, there was a subsequent period when the church at Philippi lacked the opportunity to send aid, perhaps due to their severe poverty and their financial support dried up. It had been a while since they were last able to support him in that endeavor, but that was fine with Paul. He knew that it wasn't that they lacked concern, but they lacked opportunity. That's a reference to a season or a window of opportunity, not to a chronological time. 
In writing, you have revived your concern for me. Paul was using a horror cultural term that means to bloom again. That's like saying your love has flowered again. I know it has always been there, but it didn't have opportunity to bloom. Blooms are seasonal, and the right season hadn't come along until now. The point is, is that Paul had a patient confidence in the sovereign plan of God. He was content to do without and to wait on the Lord's timing. He didn't resort to panic or manipulation of others. These things are never called for. Paul was certain that in due time, God would order the circumstances so that his needs would be met. We can have that same certainty today. Paul saw God's fingerprint everywhere and was unswayed by the vagaries of life. He saw God's providential purposes in every situation, no matter how adverse they were. His imprisonment turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, according to Philippians 1.12. Suffering was an opportunity for profound fellowship with Christ in Philippians 3.10. Even death represented the greatest personal gain as he would depart and be with Christ, according to Philippians 1.23. So in Paul's economy, there was nothing. Nothing in this world that held any real value compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, according to Philippians 3.8. And for that very reason, he was able to live through the sunshine and even the storms of life with unshakable contentment. That doesn't mean that Paul took a passive let go and let God approach to life. As John MacArthur summarizes Paul's example and work ethic throughout the New Testament as this, work as hard as you can and be content that God is in control of the results. Now, you know, today it might seem hard. It may seem like life is spiraling all out of control. But this is where you need to understand that God is unchanging. As Hebrews 13, 5 and verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. We call this the doctrine of immutability. But we also need to understand that in the person and work of the Lord Jesus, Jesus has come near to us. In the incarnation, Matthew 121 says that that Jesus came under the sentence of death. He came to die for us. He came near. He came under the sentence of death as a baby born in that manger to pay the ultimate penalty by the death of crucifixion in our place and for our sin to be buried and to rise again. And we're about to celebrate that reality as we come to Easter. And we need to remember that that all of history is moving. It's moving towards the goal. God is orchestrating all the events of our lives, the seemingly bad situation, the seemingly good situation, the season where it seems like you don't laugh for anything, and the season where, let's be honest, you're struggling. All of these seasons of our life, God is faithful. He's unchanging. He has come near to us. And this is why we can trust him. God is unchanging. God has come near. And these two twin realities that are that are described in the word of God, what they do is they help us to face all of life in the care of God, under the providence of God, and to look to God in the midst of every season of our lives with hope and with confidence that God is and always will be the same. As one of my mentors used to say, he's now with the Lord. He used to say, Dave, God is hand tailoring the situations of your life. And you know what? That is an incredible thing because if you think about it, if God isn't hand tailoring the very situations and the circumstance of our lives, then everything in our life is going to, it's all going to seemingly crash down. And maybe even today, that's how you feel. You may be going through grief or doubt or struggling with a various uh, situation at work or whatever, and on and on it goes. But you need to understand that that this season it'll only be that for a season and you need to also remember in the larger picture of everything that 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 this season of your life is but a flicker and a vapor meaning that our life is just a flicker and it's a vapor we're here today and gone tomorrow and yet and in the here and now God, what God calls us to do is he calls us to be faithful faithful to his word faithful to his son revealed in the word of God so wherever God has placed you bloom in that place bloom blossom in that place grow in that place you know we we gather together on the lord's day uh, to scatter we gather to hear the word of god preached from our biblically qualified male pastor and then we scatter from that our local church to the place where god has us where we're doing our vocation where we're doing life with our family and so on and so forth 
Bloom in that place. Men, bloom, bloom in the place where God has placed you. Don't view your vocation as, a, as something that you, d- you do all the time. Don't be a workaholic. Uh, wives, love your husband. Men, love your wife. Respect her. Walk with her. Shower her with the word of God. Uh, we need to love one another in where, wherever we're at. And we need to excel all the more in love and good deeds for the honor and glory of God alone. These things are matters of obedience, and Jesus calls us to obedience in John 14, 15. And yet our obedience is still rooted in the grace of God, and the Holy Spirit is helping us to this end because he indwells us, he equips us, he empowers us to this end to make much of the honor and glory of Christ alone. And so begin to see not just the these circumstances that are happening in your life as some sort of roadblock in your life. Begin to see even the most frustrating situations in your life. Begin to see them in the providence of God. This is but for a time. This is but for a season. This situation in the providence of God is being used to cause you, yeah, to cause you to, to lean a little bit more in prayer and a little bit more in trust and a little, to become even more like Christ, to be, to be a bit more compassionate towards those who are hurting and struggling and on and on. See, God is doing a thousand million things and he's doing it all at once. And as John Piper once said, we might see only a few of those things. Well, I want to thank you for listening or watching today's episode of the Equip You and Grace podcast. Until next week, may God bless you and keep you. Thank you for listening to the Equipping You and Grace podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe rate us on the app, and share this with your friends and family on social media. If you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at Servants of Grace, on Instagram at Servants of Grace, or by searching at Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this episode and many others like it on the front page of our website, servantsofgrace.org.